My name is Aubrey Cote and I am the current president of the Colorado Association of Pretrial Services. Over the last several years, pretrial has made great progress in Colorado. The following short film highlights Colorado's pretrial story and the tremendous work done by many to move pretrial forward. Through a collaborative effort, Colorado is implementing a statewide risk assessment, making more informed release decisions and benefiting from new bail legislation. While there is still work to be done and the progress has been challenging at times, we hope you'll find our story inspiring. Colorado is a state with rich history, diverse populations, and majestic beauty a desirable place to live, work, and play. The Centennial State can now add to its list of attributes an extraordinary story of pretrial justice reform. Recent changes to Colorado's pretrial system have put the state on the map as one model of best practices. But the ideals behind pretrial justice go back at least 50 years to the Kennedy era. What has been demonstrated here is that usually only one factor determines whether a defendant stays out of jail before he comes to trial. That factor is not guilt or innocence. It is not the nature of the crime. It is not the character of the defendant. That factor is simply money. How much money does the defendant have? The reforms suggested by Robert Kennedy have been slow to achieve but have inspired a new generation to make pretrial justice a priority. Nearly half a century ago, our nation's 64th Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, launched the national dialogue that we are extending today when he convened the first ever national conference on bail and criminal justice right here in Washington. Now, that landmark gathering helped to raise awareness about the need for pretrial justice reform and to usher in a wave of meaningful changes, most notably the Federal Bail Reform Act of 1966, which constituted the first major restructuring of the federal system since the year George Washington was sworn in as president. In 2007, a number of jurisdictions in Colorado began exploring ways to make their pretrial systems safer, fairer, and more effective. Prior to that time, pretrial decisions in Colorado were based on arbitrary bond schedules and instinct. Where we had no data, no information, everything was just by your gut feeling. Um, and you start off the day you were hired, you had gut feeling. I don't know where it came from, but you were expected to have gut feeling and make good decisions. We didn't really have a uh, validated or empirically based risk assessment tool. Each of us was using um, kind of our best guess on uh, what we thought were factors in uh, individuals returning to court. Through existing local criminal justice policy teams, some jurisdictions began to explore ways to ensure that Colorado's county pretrial justice systems honor and protect all people, including victims, witnesses, and defendants. We got together with our stakeholders, uh, you know, through that committee, and they identified seven projects or uh, areas of inquiry to see if we could, you know, uh, basically be more efficient uh, with the expenses and, and, and programming we had. And one of those uh, was just pretrial. The pretrial field at this time was experiencing a renaissance, with several research studies demonstrating the benefits of risk-based, not resource-based, decision-making, and a rapidly growing movement of national-level stakeholder groups were voicing support for reform. In Colorado, between 2008 and 2011, several projects focusing on data analysis and evidence-based reform got underway across the state. The Colorado Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, more shortly known as the CCJJ, um, was very active in trying to put together some reform um, around bail, bail laws um, within Colorado. And Mike Jones was pretty instrumental in a KISPR project, which is a special data gathering committee that was put together, um, about five years worth of data from 10 different jurisdictions around Colorado to create Colorado's own pretrial risk assessment tool. 
This project was instrumental in shifting the way justice stakeholders viewed how the system worked. I have to admit that I was initially a skeptic about pretrial reform until I sat on my local criminal justice coordinating committee's bail subcommittee, and then I was exposed to the national research and the data, and our local data showed us that risk-based decision-making had benefits that monetary bail bond schedules did not have. So what we learned was that by implementing a risk-based assessment, judges could make a release or detain decision based upon the individual risk and set release conditions that would address risk of individuals who were released into the community. Change had begun. That even as we were talking about making changes, before we made any changes at all, the system had already started changing. There had already been a culture shift began just by discussing it, just by sharing some research, by sharing some of the thoughts behind uh, risk-based uh, analysis and data-driven decision-making, it already created uh, a, a climate of willing change. But there were some who opposed change. In 2010, out-of-state lobbyists for the for-profit bail system introduced a voter initiative requiring nearly all arrestees to post some form of money bond for pretrial release. It was called Proposition 102. Which I didn't recognize was the strength and power of the bail industry's lobbying effort and the insurance companies lobbying abilities uh, because when we started into this world um, of trying to make some inroads on getting more people released or get, uh, on the bail system the pushback was pretty amazing and it was wrapped around we're destroying small businesses it wasn't the discussion wasn't directed towards innocent people being in custody. It was that if we change the system, um, bondsmen would go out of business and small businesses would then be impacted. Reaction to the bondsman's proposition was swift and certain. Well, all you had to do was, is hear about it and get pissed off. Do you know what I mean? It was one of these the abs most absurd, self-interested, um, um, propositions I, I have seen in criminal justice. So it wasn't hard to sort of galvanize opposition. So organizationally, we took a position in opposition and then mobilized and organized. Uh, you know, it wasn't a big campaign. Um, it didn't have a lot of legs to begin with if you just sort of did a political analysis on it, but we, there needed to be a response. So it was absolutely ridiculous. It would have cost the state so much money and it would have clogged up our jails with people who really did not need to be there. The bail bonding industry was completely behind it and we would say that everybody from the attorney general, the Republican attorney general, to the ACLU was against Prop 102. Opponents to Prop 102 included the American Civil Liberties Union, commissioners from a number of Colorado counties, the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police, and the county sheriffs of Colorado, the coalitions against sexual assault and domestic violence, the state's defense bar and district attorney's council, Governor Bill Ritter, and Attorney General John Southers, State Senate President Brandon Schaefer, a number of state senators and representatives and many other organizations committed to social justice inside Colorado. So we very quickly established a coalition of opposition that included so many organizations, groups, individuals who were all willing to stand up and say that this is a very bad idea for Colorado. In November 2010, after hearing vigorous campaigns on both sides, two-thirds of Colorado voters defeated Prop 102. Collaborative partnerships that were formed in opposition to Prop 102 continued, allowing pretrial justice efforts to move forward quickly and with broad support. 
I think Prop 102 really gave pre-child programs the opportunity to come together in a way that they hadn't before. It gave them something to organize around, it gave them some messaging, a way to talk about what they do, the value of what they do, and really, I think, got them fired up to continue to work on this issue and to make Colorado you know, on the forefront of pre-child justice reform. The Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, the state's existing body for investigating potential areas of system improvement, established a bail subcommittee in 2011, moving the issue from individual counties up to the state level. Well, the bail subcommittee met for approximately 18 months. Um, it had representatives from the district attorney's office, from the judicial department, which included judges as well as probation people. It had uh, defense lawyers, myself, the public defender. We also had a, a representative from the bail bond industry uh, on this group, and we looked at the history of bail, what the purposes of bail were, the research, all the relevant standards. So it was kind of a comprehensive look. And then at the end of the day, it was, what can we agree on? The bail subcommittee uh, produced four recommendations, um, and essentially what they said, what the recommendations were, was that um, the pretrial release decision should rely on or be based upon an empirically developed risk assessment assessment instrument. Um, that there should be a reduction in the reliance of bail schedules that are you know, really tied to the level of, of offense or the, or the type of top charge. Um, there was an effort to expand pretrial services in jurisdictions um, that, where it currently doesn't exist, where the court oftentimes is faced with making that decision to release or not uh, with minimal information, only the top charge available. And then there was an effort to work on data collection so that moving forward we could evaluate sort of the impacts of this reform. The Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice adopted the bail subcommittee's recommendations and work began to shape them into legislation. The two years following the defeat of Prop 102 were active ones for policymakers and advocates of legal and evidence-based pretrial. The Colorado Pretrial Assessment Tool, or CPAT, was developed and implemented in jurisdictions across the state, helping stakeholders make more informed release decisions and better manage their jail populations. I always knew what the percentage of our pretrial population was inside our jail. Uh, it's pretty consistent with the national average of about two-thirds of our jail population being pretrial. But the thing that I never knew was what is the risk profile of that, of that population. Uh, incorporating risk and risk assessment into our system has allowed me to understand really what the risk is of that population. And we're using that risk assessment now to make sure that w those precious jail beds are being used for the riskiest people. We're seeing, um, number one, our jail population of pretrial people is higher risk than it has ever been, which means we're doing things right. We're keeping the riskiest people, the people that we're scared of, in jail. Um, we're, getting, we're diverting more low-risk people out of the jail. Uh, at the same time, our PR rates are really high for low-risk people, and they're low for high-risk people, which is the way we want it. And, at the, and we see no change in our public safety rates. So while we're doing all of this, uh, we're not seeing anything that makes our community less safe. The rich data collected during the CPAT allowed for a study comparing different types of release on financial conditions. The main finding from our Colorado study was that, and, and this is subtle, but the type of money or the type of financial condition uh, did not seem to have an impact on uh, defendants' pretrial uh, behavior, meaning that whether a defendant paid uh, hundred percent of uh, his bond amounts prior to release, like through a cash bond, or he went through a commercial bail bondsman and paid somewhere between zero to 15 percent, which is uh, in Colorado, or he paid nothing down prior to release through an unsecured recognizance bond, that he was just as likely to show up for all his court appearances and not pick up new charges. In addition, work began in the legislature. Then the work began of converting those recommendations to a bill. 
to say how do we put that, those recommendations, into uh, bill language. Through a rigorous statutory process, Colorado's bail statutes were changed to reflect the new focus on risk assessment as a necessary component of pretrial decision making, and money as just one of the many options at the pretrial stage. At the end of the process, major pretrial system improvements were signed into law. That happy day, um, no one opposed. It was a comprehensive bill at that point. Um, it uh, was the, the insurance industry, the bail bond industry um, became neutral on the bill. Um, and we sailed through the legislature 99 to 1. So I sponsored um, House Bill 1236 in the 2013 legislative session, and it was a recommendation of the CCJJ, the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice. I was willing to take that on because I had seen these previous efforts fail. I had seen the bail bond industry organize and try to capitalize on concern about public safety, and I felt like you know, it was just time to really take it on and address it head on. You know, the bill came out of that collaborative process and the bail bondsmen were at the table. It doesn't mean they loved it, but they were at the table. And they, so they couldn't say that they didn't have a voice in this process. stakeholders are committed to ensuring that the system has the tools it needs to be safe, fair, and effective. One key component missing is the ability, through due process, to detain without bail those deemed too dangerous to be released. In Colorado, what we really need to do is, going forward, we need to reform our preventative detention statute. Uh, we sort of have a preventative detention statute, but it's so narrow and so unworkable that as I have traveled around the state and talked to prosecutors, I have never heard of one instance where our preventative st detention statute has been able to be used in Colorado, ever. I've never run into any case where it's been able to be used. Currently, because we do not have a workable preventative detention statute in Colorado, a judge's only choice is to set a significant money bond. An area where the bail subcommittee could have um, drilled a little further and looked deeper in Colorado, our preventative detention or our ability to detain high or very high risk defendants, um, there's a gap. Um, we're, it's very restrictive or selective when uh, a proof evident presumption is great hearing can be held. And so what we see is even our highest risk pretrial defendants end up being released. And I wish that the bail subcommittee would have looked harder at that issue. Pretrial professionals are maintaining the collaborative relationships begun in recent years. One example is the Pretrial Executive Network, or PEN. The Pretrial Executive Network is, uh, really demonstrates the collaboration and camaraderie of pretrial professionals um, in Colorado. It's, a, it's just a grassroots group. Um, after the CPAT was developed, we started to talk about, hey, we need to continue to get together and let's talk pretrial. Let's talk best practices. Let's make sure that we're not working in a vacuum. The pen. Um, is a volunteer group. It's uh, directors of pretrial programs come together about every couple months. Each county um, volunteers to host the pen meeting. We develop a informal uh, agenda and we talk pretrial. Caps at the time identified that you know this was really an opportunity for us to make sure that we were providing services to the members of our association and really um, strengthening pretrial through practitioners. And with um, kind of partnering with the Penn Group and their support of CAPS, we really took on a lot of projects that before CAPS was kind of um, a quieter um, entity. And really with the strength of the directors through Penn, we were able to move forward and do some things um, supported by them. In the last two years, states across the country have begun to recognize the public safety, officer safety, and fairness benefits of pretrial justice improvements. 
In Colorado, work continues. The state will improve and refine its statutes and procedures to remain at the forefront of pretrial justice. Colorado has made great strides in improving pretrial justice in local jurisdictions and statewide, but there is more work to be done. Continued progress in this area will require research, education, and most of all, collaboration. I look forward to the next chapter in Colorado pretrial justice reform. Thank you.